Hello, everyone. My name is Lori Hutchison. I'm the Executive Director of the Lobular Breast Cancer Alliance, and I am happy to welcome you to the LBCA webinar, What's New in Screening and Treatment for Lobular Breast Cancer? We'll be hearing today from three panelists who've been engaged in lobular breast cancer treatment and research, who will tell us about the current state of affairs in screening and treatment for lobular breast cancer patients and how protocols may be changing the future, including what new methods for screening and surveillance and treatments may be on the horizon. We'll save about 10 to 15 minutes at the end for your questions, um, but please feel free to send them during the presentations. And please understand we will not be able to address any questions that are personal or about someone's specific treatment. We know that we have limited time, so we will be recording the session and we will be able to, at the end, uh, see any remaining questions and get them out to the panelists. And when we post the recording, we'll be able to post answers to questions that we've received at that time as well. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our three panelists and I'm introducing them in the order that we will be hearing from them. First, we will hear from Dr. Tali Amir. She's an assistant attending radiologist at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, subspecializing in breast imaging. She received her medical degree from Robert Wood Johnson Rutgers University. She completed her residency in diagnostic radiology at John Hopkins Hospital and fellowship in breast imaging at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Her research focuses on improving breast cancer screening and diagnosis, particularly through new technologies, including the use of contrast enhanced mammography, artificial intelligence decision support in breast ultrasound evaluation, and 3D image guided procedures. Her research has also looked at maximizing technological opportunities to improve the patient experience in the academic breast imaging environment. Her research has resulted in first author publications in peer-reviewed scientific journals, as well as scientific oral presentations and exhibits at national meetings. We'll hear next from Dr. Anita Mamtani. Dr. Mamtani is a breast surgical oncologist at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and an assistant professor of surgery at Weill Cornell Medical College. She received her medical degree from the Jefferson Medical College, followed by residency in general surgery at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center at Harvard Medical School, and completed both research and clinical fellowships in breast surgical oncology at MSKCC. Her research interests focus on leveraging the benefits of multimodality therapy to tailor surgery in breast cancer in order to decrease the burden of therapy for patients, along with examining understudied breast cancer subsets, such as invasive lobular carcinoma. She currently runs a clinical trial evaluating a novel approach in upfront surgery for patients with early stage, node positive, HR positive, HER2 negative breast cancer. Her work has been presented at national meetings, and she maintains active membership in local and national societies, including the Society of Surgical Oncology and the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Our third speaker will be Dr. Renat Jesselson. Dr. Jesselson is Assistant Professor of Medicine at Harvard Med Medical School, Associate Physician of Medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and Medical Oncologist at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. She has been engaged in breast cancer research for over a decade and currently focuses on the mechanisms of treatment resistance and tumor progression in hormone receptive positive breast cancer. A practicing clinician, Dr. Jesselson is also the lead investigator for clinical trials that she designed based on findings from her research and with the goal of finding new treatments for those with breast cancer. We are also very fortunate to also have Dr. Jesselson on the LBCA Scientific Advisory Board and we're very grateful to her for having been the chair this past year. And um, I welcome all of you panelists. Thank you so much for your time. And I'm now going to turn it over to you, Dr. Amir, to take us off. Thank you so much for the introduction. So yes, I'm gonna speak on detection and surveillance of invasive lobular cancer. 
We'll start with a brief overview and then discuss best screening practices. We'll delve into the challenges in detection and diagnosis of breast cancer and invasive lobular carcinoma or ILC specifically. We'll move on to discuss best surveillance practices and then briefly touch on what we can be hopeful for looking in the future. Starting with a brief overview, as many of you may know, um, invasive lobular carcinoma is the second most common type of breast cancer following invasive ductal cancer, and it accounts for 10 to 15% of all breast cancers, so this is not a rare cancer. It's often diagnosed, though, at a larger tumor size when compared to invasive ductal cancer. It also is more commonly presenting as multifocal or multicentric disease, meaning multiple tumors within the breast. And it also tends to recur later, more than 10 years after initial diagnosis. How do we screen for breast cancer or invasive lobular cancer? Well, first I want to define what it means to screen for cancer. It means we're trying to detect cancer in somebody who is otherwise without symptoms or signs of disease. And we do this with mammography. That is our standard of breast cancer screening. In the 2000s, we converted to digital mammography from film screen mammography. And today we predominantly use something called digital breast homosynthesis or 3D mammography. And this is different than 2D mammography in that our X-ray rotates around the patient to create one millimeter thin slices uh, that we can comb through. And here's an example of what a mammogram looks like. And to orient you, in breast imaging, we look at the patient in reverse. So this breast is the right breast. It's pointing to the left of the screen. The right image is called the medial lateral oblique view or MLO view. And this is a view from the side at an angle. And it allows us to see tissue that's extending up under the arm. And you can imagine the patient's head is above the image, feet below, and they're looking to the left. The left image is craniocaudal standing for from head to tail or CC view. And the little cartoon in the corner is showing you how a patient would position for this view. And you can imagine the head and feet projecting in and out of the screen. The way we screen for mammogram is based on a woman's risk profile. A woman who has less than a 15% lifetime risk of breast cancer is considered average risk. And we use mammogram starting at the age of 40. And we discussed our 2D and 3D mammogram options. Ultrasound can also be added on as a supplemental screening tool, and this is particularly noted to be beneficial in women with dense breasts. There are women, though, who have above average lifetime risk. 15 to 20% lifetime risk is an intermediate risk of breast cancer, and greater than 20% is a high risk. And in these patients, we can consider contrast modalities. Patients get an IV in their arm, and contrast is given through the vein, and we can do contrast mammogram or contrast MRI. And these tools take advantage of something called tumor angiogenesis, that tumor cells create increased blood supply to them to help them grow, and contrast follows blood flow. And on the left here, you see a contrast mammogram with an enhancing mass, and on the right is our 3D um, projection image of an MRI showing that same mass. Sometimes patients do present with symptoms as their first sign of cancer. These may involve a palpable lump or a mass that the patient is feeling, nipple symptoms like discharge or inversion, and skin changes like redness and thickening. And in this situation, we'll start with mammogram as early as 30 years old and often add on ultrasound, but we also have contrast mammogram and MRI in our tool belt to use as needed. So now I'm going to delve into challenges that we face when detecting and diagnosing cancer. And to do that, I want to start back orienting us with our mammogram. And these are four different breast densities. What do I mean? There is the black tissue that you see, and that is the fatty tissue. And there's white tissue that is the fibroglandular tissue. And breast cancers are often white. So I've drawn in a white circle here to represent our cancer. And you can see on our leftmost image where there's a lot of fatty tissue, that white circle is much more obvious. But if you look at the third image from the left, our heterogeneously dense tissue, you can see that that white circle is almost invisible. Invasive lobular carcinoma presents unique challenges. The cells tend to grow in a single file rather than clump together. And so the cancers can be very inconspicuous, very subtle and challenging to see on mammogram. Additionally, they present with very variable appearance. So they can present as a mass, but they may also present as distortion, which is a pulling appearance, and I'll show an example, or an asymmetry, which is tissue, that white fibroglandular tissue, 
may start to appear larger or more dense over time, but we don't see a discrete mass. Here is an example of architectural distortion. On the left image is our 2D mammogram, and this would be read as normal. But in this situation, we had a 3D mammogram with those one millimeter thin slices. And the right is an image stopped on one of those one millimeter thin slices. And my arrow is pointing to the center of distortion, a pulling. And you can almost make out alternating white and black thin lines emanating from a central point. This is an example of architectural distortion that we can see on tomosynthesis or 3D imaging that can often be invisible or not identifiable on 2D imaging. Here's an example of a developing asymmetry. So our central images are mammogram that was the up-to-date mammogram, and our outside images are the older mammogram. And you can see that small white island of fibroglandular tissue has slowly enlarged over the course of three years. There was no discrete mass seen. This was biopsied though and shown to be invasive lobular carcinoma. Once a patient is diagnosed with invasive lobular carcinoma, it's important for us to be able to communicate to the patient and to their clinical team the size of the tumor, the beginning and ends. And in some situations, that can be very challenging. And in such cases, we may wanna consider additional imaging like contrast mammogram and MRI to further define the tumor size. And studies have shown that MRI and contrast mammogram have comparable performance in doing so. A couple studies have looked specifically at the role of MRI in invasive lobular cancer and have shown that MRI before surgery can help identify additional disease in up to a quarter of patients, and this can impact clinical management. Here are some examples. This is a young woman with extremely dense breasts who came in feeling a lump, and that triangle marker projecting over the breast is what she's feeling. In that area on mammogram, there's nothing particularly suspicious. Ultrasound was performed. And what we saw is we would consider heterogeneous tissue, essentially the black and white echoes that we were seeing looked different than the other healthy tissue, but we could not see a clear mass. This was biopsied and shown to be invasive lobular carcinoma. And this is a perfect example of where we felt like we could not define the beginnings and ends of this tumor. And so contrast mammogram was performed. And you can see this very dense white area in the lower central portion of the breast showing where the tumor is. Here's another example of a young woman with extremely dense breast and her mammogram was read as normal, but on ultrasound we saw a very small mass. This was biopsied and shown to be invasive lobular carcinoma. The challenging thing is that as we scanned, in some views this mass appeared very subtle and the borders very ill-defined. So MRI was performed. And here is an example, you can see marked asymmetric enhancement. That left breast, which is projecting on the right in our screen here, has a lot more enhancement than we initially saw on ultrasound. And this was shown to be disease involving the entirety of the breast. So now we'll move on to surveillance. How do we best screen after somebody has been treated for invasive lobular carcinoma to detect recurrence or new disease? We're gonna to go to our, our same procedure or exams that we had. 3D mammogram, ultrasound, contrast mammogram, and MRI. Now here's an example of contrast mammogram after somebody has had surgery for invasive lobular cancer. And those small white dense lines are what are the surgical clips. So those are identifying the surgical bed for us. And you can see on the outer images, the patient has very dense breasts and there's a lot of white in the area of the surgical clips. And that may be fibroglandular tissue and scar tissue. The central images are a contrast mammogram, and you can see there's no enhancement, letting us know there's no recurrence at the surgical bed. And we know that contrast mammogram has much higher cancer detection rates than 2D mammogram alone. Here's another example of a patient. She has a history of lumpectomy for lobular pathology, and you can see there's an enhancing mass on the contrast images, but the 2D mammogram would be read as completely normal. MRI was done for biopsy planning, and biopsy showed invasive lobular carcinoma. So another example in which a 2D mammogram would have been read as normal, but invasive lobular recurrence was identified. As I mentioned earlier, we can use breast MRI for surveillance as well. This image is from an MRI of a young woman with very dense breasts with a history of lobular carcinoma. She had a mammogram one week earlier that was read as normal, but you can see there's an enhancing mass and this was recurrence. And studies show that MRI is particularly useful in women who were diagnosed at a young age, less than 50, at detecting early stage but biologically aggressive tumors. 
So very briefly, I'll just touch on what we can be hopeful for looking in the future. And that's the role of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence or AI is not new in radiology and it's not new in breast imaging. For a long time, it's been used in mammography um, and we see it in ultrasound and MRI but a lot less has been available to us looking at lobular carcinomas. A recent study published just this year looked at uh, software helping to detect invasive lobular carcinoma on mammogram. And uh, a group here at our institution, we're looking at the utility of decision support tools on ultrasound as ultrasound is widely available and accessible tool, not just throughout the country, but the world. So to finish on take home points, um, ILC is not a rare cancer, but it can be very challenging to detect uh, given its inconspicuous and variable appearance. But we do have great tools like 3D mammography, ultrasound, contrast mammogram, and MRI that we can use and consider depending on a patient's personal risk profile. So thank you here um, for having me here today. And I'll pass on to Dr. Mamtani to continue. Great, thank you. It is a pleasure to be here and I thank the LBCA for the opportunity to participate. I will be discussing the current state of surgery for lobular breast cancer in 2023, and I hope to not only provide an overview of our surgical approaches, but also to delve into some of the specific questions uh, and answers that tend to come up specifically when discussing lobular breast cancer. I have no disclosures. Firstly, as a very general broad overview, uh, when we approach a patient with a new diagnosis and we look to design a treatment approach for them, there is a very fundamental initial evaluation process that really is very common among all breast cancer types. We will utilize the patient's history, a thorough physical exam, as well as, of course, their imaging and their pathology to design their uh, individual uh, situation and determine their individual diagnosis. In the past couple of decades, it has really become very evident that not all patients are the same, and certainly not all breast cancers are the same. And we live in an era of precision medicine in which integration of all of this information about the cancer diagnosis and the patient themselves is very important and necessary uh, to create an individualized and tailored treatment plan. Before going into details about surgery itself, I think the first decision that has to be made is the actual timeline of treatment and the timeline of events. We can either take patients for upfront surgery, meaning that we do surgery first, and this is the general approach for many early stage cancers. The alternative, though, is to take a neoadjuvant approach, meaning that patients receive medicine first, uh, followed by surgery at a later date. And this this is an approach that we utilize more often for advanced disease, such as patients with larger tumors or a greater lymph node involvement, as well as certain subtypes of cancer, such as HER2 positive and triple negative subtypes, which are known to be relatively uncommon in lobular disease. When thinking about surgery for ILC, the fundamentals are again really very similar to those for other types of breast cancer. We have to think about two components for surgery, the first being the breast itself, and then the second being the axilla, in other words, the armpit where the lymph nodes are located. I'll start by talking about the breast first. Uh, generally, we have two options for how to treat the breast uh, for surgically. One is breast conserving surgery, which is also referred to as lumpectomy, which refers to removal of the tumor within the breast, uh, along with a rim of normal tissue around it, which is called a margin. The alternative option is something called a mastectomy, which refers to removal of the entire breast, including, of course, the tumor that is inside of it. And this can be performed with or without reconstruction and utilizing various techniques, such as skin sparing options or even nipple sparing options. And some of the illustrations that I have here uh, on the right side of the screen show what these different approaches look like, uh, either without reconstruction or with, with reconstruction. 
But the question that is first asked by most of our patients when we see them is, how do we choose? How do we choose between which option we utilize to treat the tumor in the breast? There are a very large number of factors that are taken into consideration, and these include the extent of the disease, the location of the tumor, the size of the tumor, various individual patient factors, their genetics, family history, as well as, of course, the patient's own preference. For patients with early stage breast cancer, it is actually very well established that survival outcomes after lumpectomy and radiation are equivalent to the outcomes seen after mastectomy. And this is something that has been established through multiple randomized trials, uh, which have over 25 years of follow-up, uh, and rates of local recurrence uh, have been shown to be less than 10% uh, with modern adjuvant therapies. Now, patients will often ask us whether these very similar outcomes between lumpectomy and mastectomy are true when looking at lobular breast cancer patients as well. And this is a valid question to ask because just by virtue of being less common, uh, the lobular breast cancers have comprised a minority in many of the trials that were done in years past. This has been investigated though in multiple studies, just one of which I highlight here, uh, which showed that the long-term survival outcomes were indeed equivalent between lung lumpectomy and mastectomy, even when comparing uh, only these lobular patients, if negative margins were achieved and this was subsequently validated. A second very frequent question is whether positive margins at the time of lumpectomy are more common in patients who have ILC. And along those lines, patients will often ask us, is mastectomy also more frequently required by patients who have ILC? And this, I would say, is also a rather intuitive question uh, based on that innate uh, growth pattern of ILC and the difficult preoperative assessment of extent of disease that we heard about. Uh, and there have been mixed findings reported with some early studies showing no difference in rates of re-excision, of needing to do more surgery, uh, while other studies have reported some association with positive lumpectomy margins and a slightly higher likelihood of needing a re-operation. Ultimately, we really do rely quite heavily on the preoperative workup, particularly with imaging, to determine the optimal surgical plan. And at the end of the day, one of the most important outcomes that matters most to our patients and to us is recurrence. And uh, it is often asked whether patients with ILC are at a higher risk of local recurrence compared to other types of breast cancer. Happily, there is actually a rather large and robust body of evidence that shows that once negative margins are obtained at the time of surgery, patients with ILC do have similar outcomes with modern rates of local recurrence after breast conservation, ranging between three to 6%. Finally, patients will also often ask us with lobular breast cancer, can they have reconstruction? Is anything different for a patient with an ILC uh, versus a patient with a different histology? And here also we find that there is no major difference in the reconstructive options that are available to patients with lobular breast cancers. Uh, it's a little bit outside of the scope of the talk, but generally speaking, we can do breast reconstruction after mastectomy with either implants or the use of autonomy autologous tissue, and these are options that are generally available to patients with ILC as well and are discussed at the time of a consultation with a plastic surgeon. Having touched upon the breast, I'll shift a little bit to talk about management of the axilla at the time of surgery or the armpit. And generally speaking, we have two options for how we can handle the axilla surgically. One of these is called a sentinel lymph node biopsy, and the other is called an axillary lymph node dissection. Axillary lymph node dissection refers to removal of all of the lymph nodes in the lower two levels of the axilla, which is generally required by patients who have a heavy burden of disease in their lymph nodes. On the other hand, a sentinel lymph node biopsy refers to a selective removal of just a few lymph nodes that we call the sentinel nodes. Uh, in other words, they are like the gatekeepers in the chain of lymphatics, and we detect those by injecting a dye into the breast that gets taken up by those nodes. This option is definitely increasingly utilized to stage the axilla in patients with early stage cancers who do not have any known disease in their lymph nodes before surgery. 
I will note that there are some scenarios in which we omit surgery in the axilla, meaning we do not do any uh, surgery in the axilla, but these are very selected cases, such as patients over the age of 70, with stage one hormone positive HER2 negative tumors or significant comorbidities. But overall, the surgical approach and the selection of which option is utilized is very similar for lobular breast cancer patients as it is for other cancer types. A frequent question that comes up here is whether patients with ILC more often have lymph node involvement. And the data is actually a little bit mixed here as well. Some studies have indicated no difference in the likelihood of having nodal spread, while other studies, a small number, have reported a slight increase in the likelihood of seeing that with lobular breast cancer. Happily though, it is well established that sentinel lymph node biopsy is equally feasible and safe for ILC patients, and sentinel lymph node biopsy does provide uh, equivalent uh, axillary control for patients with lobular histology, uh, as well as not predicting a need to do an axillary dissection. So while the discohesive growth pattern of ILC and just the biology of lobular cancer might make these patients a little bit more prone to nodal metastasis, fortunately, it does not seem to significantly alter the surgical management that is required to address that. So to summarize a bit of a whirlwind, uh, the fundamentals of surgical management of ILC do remain very similar to how we manage other breast cancer histologies. But as you have heard, breast cancer detection and certainly the treatment continues to evolve very dramatically uh, with time and with research advancements. At this point, the tailoring of our medical treatments is truly the next frontier, and tumor biology is clearly going to be the key to uh, continue to optimize our outcomes. At the end of the day, I would say the ultimate goals are always to individually tailor treatment, to decrease the morbidity of surgery, uh, to achieve excellent cancer outcomes, but also try to improve the quality of life of our breast cancer survivors. Uh, and with that, I will wrap up. Thank you. And I look forward to fielding questions you might have at the end. I'll hand it over to Dr. Jesselson uh, for the next component. All right. Um, so thank you for the invitation to be here. It's a real uh, pleasure. Um, and I will be talking about um, invasive lobular breast cancers, um, current um, systemic treatments, and future directions. Um, and since I have uh, don't have that much time to go over a lot of data, I'm going to do this at a very high level, but happy to take uh, questions afterwards. So as we have just heard, invasive lobular cancers are the second most common histological subtype of breast cancers, and that's after what we call now um, invasive cancers of no special type. Pre previously, these were um, called invasive ductal cancers. Um, and about 15% of all breast cancers are lobular breast cancers. And over the past two decades, the incidence of ILC has increased, really highlighting the importance of invasive lobular breast cancers. And we now know that invasive lobular breast cancer is really a unique disease um, from because of several factors, both clinical factors and also biological factors. So there is data that the risk factors associated with invasive lobular cancers is a little bit different compared to invasive ductal cancers or non-specific type of invasive cancer. Also, the clinical presentation is different. Histology is different. Um, the molecular subtypes uh, um, are different genetics, as well as um, we have recent data showing that the epigenetics of lobular breast cancers are also uh, different. So as far as risk factors, um, overall, the risk factors of uh, invasive lobular breast cancer are quite similar to invasive ductal uh, cancers or nonspecific type. However, what is different is the, um, the strength of the associations. And it seems there are studies showing that age of first menstrual period, age of first birth, and particularly um, use of postmenopausal hormonal um, uh, treatments could be more strongly associated with invasive lobular cancers. And that may also explain the increase in the incidence of lobular breast cancer over the past two decades. 
As far as clinical presentation, the age of diagnosis of invasive lobular breast cancer is slightly higher compared to invasive ductal cancers. Um, and as we just heard, they present larger tumors, lymph node involvement. Um, many times they are multifocal and also um, there are considerations as far as uh, mammography or other imaging that we have just heard of. As far as the histology, so really invasive lobular breast cancers are, are known to grow in single cell um, file patterns, as you can see here, as opposed to invasive ductal cancers that grow in clumps, and there are tubal formation in ductal cancers, where all, whereas in lobular breast cancers, there are no tubal formations. But really, the, um, the um, hallmark of lobular breast cancers is the loss of ecadherin, um, which is a, pro adhesion, a cell adhesion protein, and as you can see here in the staining, these slides with staining of ecadherin, this is a invasive ductal cancer where you see this membranous staining of ecadherin, and it is completely um, lost in lobular breast, in most of lobular breast cancers. Importantly, one of the other um, unique features of lobular breast cancers, which is also um, a significant challenge as we design studies or um, investigate uh, large data sets of patients, of with invasive lobular breast cancers is the fact that it actually is not one disease, but there are multiple uh, variants of invasive lobular breast cancer with the classic um, variant being the most common um, and comprising more than 50% of all lobular breast cancers. But there are also um, variants such as alveolar, uh, the mixed non-classical, which includes the pleomorphic um, there's also the solid and trabecular, and both the mixed and solid have um, higher proliferation and also worse prognosis when we compare them um, to the classic invasive lobular cancers. As far as molecular subtypes, majority of invasive lobular breast cancers are of the luminal um, subtype. Um, whereas invasive ductal cancers, you can see uh, luminal subtypes are 42% um, only. Um, also, invasive lobular breast cancers are mostly, more than 90% of them are ER positive, HER2 negative, whereas in invasive ductal cancers, about 55% uh, are ER positive, HER2 negative. We also know um, that the genetics in invasive lobular cancers are slightly different than invasive ductal cancers. Um, and as I noted before, the majority of lobular breast cancers have loss of ecadherin, and that is due to a mutation or a loss of 16Q, um, the location of, CD of ecadherin gene. Um, they also have higher um, uh, prevalence of PIK3CA mutations and lower prevalence of P53 mutations. In addition, we conducted a study um, not that long ago and showed that the uh, chromatin state of lobular breast cancers is different than invasive ductal cancers. So how do we treat um, early stage invasive lobular um, cancers? Overall, currently there are no specific guidelines um, for uh, systemic treatment in invasive lobular breast cancers and similar to other um, hormone receptor positive breast cancers, the systemic treatment in early stage disease includes um, endocrine treatments and yes or no uh, chemotherapy. Now in general, um, chemotherapy in early stage disease, the, in early stage ear positive breast cancer, uh, the decision is really determined based on the molecular ris risk of the cancer, um, which is based on um, the grade, um, as well as uh, molecular stratification tools that we have today, such as the Oncotype DX uh, recurrence score tool. Um, and also um, these decisions are based on the tumor burden, meaning the size of the tumor number of positive lymph nodes. In addition, also um, menopausal status uh, plays a role in, the, in these decisions. So do patients with early stage invasive lobular breast cancer benefit from chemotherapy? Um, a number of studies have looked at um, the added benefit of or the benefit of neoadjuvant chemotherapy. As we heard, we can give treatments prior to surgery, and then we can see um, what what is the residual tumor, what how much tumor is left at the time of surgery, and that's what we call um, when there's no tumor left. That's called path CR or pathological complete response. 
Uh, most of these studies are retrospective, but there is also one prospective study looking um, at the um, path CR rates in um, invasive lobular cancer versus invasive ductal cancers with neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And as you can see here, really there was very limited um, benefit to neoadjuvant chemotherapy in um, invasive lobular breast cancers, as you see here in this study, um, zero path CRs in ILC versus 15% path CRs in IDC. As far as adjuvant chemotherapy, so chemotherapy after surgery, also um, there are uh, studies, and these are mostly um, retrospective analyses of large data, of large uh, patient cohorts, showing that really there is no added benefit to uh, chemotherapy in invasive lobular cancers. Um, these studies are, of course, limited because these are from these are retrospective studies that are not um, corrected for different. Uh, variables that could affect uh, the uh, benefit from chemotherapy and also not adjusted for oncotype DX recurrent score or other um, risk stratification molecular tools that we now use for decision making um, in adjuvant uh, chemotherapy. Uh, one recent uh, large analysis from the National Cancer uh, Database did correct for the Oncotype DX recurrence score using a cutoff of 26. So below 26 is relatively low risk, and above 26 is relatively high molecularly high risk breast cancers. That in general, large studies have shown that patients with an Oncotype DX of above 26 do benefit from chemotherapy. But in this study, looking at patients with invasive lobular cancer only, you can see that even in patients with an oncotype DX score of 26 or above, there was no benefit to the addition of chemotherapy. On the other hand, there are now studies, more recent studies looking at that do show benefit of chemotherapy. And in large, these studies show that the benefit is really based on uh, clinical um, high-risk uh, features. And in this study, that was a um, meta-analysis. Uh, this was a study based on data from 15 academic French cancer centers. They showed that really patients who um, had large tumors, had positive lymph nodes, had lymphovascular invasion, and uh, relatively high-grade tumors, those were invasive lobular cancers that did benefit from chemotherapy. And they also established a scoring system that, again, included evidence or no evidence of macroscopic in, um, lymph node involvement, tumor size below or above two centimeters, yes or no lymphovascular invasion. And you can see that using this scoring system, they were able to identify a patient population with invasive lobular breast cancer that does benefit from chemotherapy. As I mentioned, the Oncotype DX recurrence score um, in, in, um, did, not, did, not, did not identify patients who, um, who did benefit from chemotherapy and invasive lobular breast cancer. And another issue with Oncotype DX recurrence score is that most invasive lobular breast cancers do not have a high, 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 high score, making it hard to, to really, uh, um, really establish the role of Oncotype DX recurrence scores in invasive lobular breast cancers. There are, however, investigation investigators that are now trying to develop a new um, genomic um, uh, tool that can help us um, really predict who are the patients with invasive lobular breast cancer um, that do benefit from chemotherapy. Um, one one uh, signature that was um, that was published is called the LobSig, which is a gene set of 194 genes that was shown to be prognostic of survival in invasive lobular breast cancer. So what about endocrine therapy and invasive lobular cancers? Obviously, a majority of invasive lobular breast cancers are ER positive, um, and, um, and as such, we treat um, most invasive lobular breast cancers with adjuvant endocrine therapy. Um, there was some suggestion that maybe the difference between um, tamoxifen versus aromatase inhibitors is different in invasive lobular breast cancers, but additional studies did not confirm that. And in general, in breast cancer, um, there is, uh, there's a large um, there's a large large body of data showing that in general um, aromatase inhibitors are better than tamoxifen, and that is usually our standard of care for postmenopausal women with ER positive breast cancer. 
But since um, there is potential preclinical data and a signal that potentially there might be some differences in invasive lobular cancer um, compared to invasive duct ductal cancer as far as um, uh, benefit from specific endocrine therapies. And this is important because um, there are now new endocrine therapies that are in clinical development. Um, there are currently a number of ongoing um, clinical trials that are trying to really understand is the response or is the biology um, of ILC such that, that there are differences in the response in specific endocrine therapies um, in lobular breast cancers compared to ductal cancers? One study um, is the PLAP study that um, was con that was led by that's led by Otto Metzger, a colleague of mine from Dana Farber. In this study, um, patients are randomized to tamoxifen versus uh, letrozole. Um, and this study um, is specifically enriched in patients with invasive lobular breast cancer. Another study that's run by the D TBCRC um, is also a neoadjuvant study for postmenopausal women. And this is a study dedicated to patients with invasive lobular breast cancer, in which patients are randomized to tamoxifen and astrazole and fulvestrin. And the primary endpoint is to look at the changes of proliferation uh, comparing these different treatments. In addition, there is also another um, study in, that is dedicated to patients with lobular breast cancer, and this is looking at a new potential target um, for invasive lobular breast cancer. So a few years ago, there was a study that had identified um, ROS1, so ROS is reactive oxygen species, um, protein, so inhibitors of ROS1 um, are particularly effective in tumors that have loss of E. cadherin. And since lobular breast cancers have loss of E. cadherin, um, these cancers may be uh, particularly sensitive to ROS1 inhibitors. And based on this um, preclinical data, there is currently a new adjuvant study um, called Rosaline um, that is looking at a ROS1 inhibitor or entrictinib um, in combination with letrozole, specifically for patients with invasive lobular breast cancer. This study is currently enrolling, and hopefully we will hear uh, results from this study in the near future. So what about metastatic invasive lobular breast cancer? Um, we know that one of the unique uh, features of invasive lobular breast cancers is the clinical presentation of metastatic disease since um, metastatic lobular breast cancer can be found in, in certain sites that are not typically seen in invasive lobular, in invasive ductal cancers, such as um, the gastrointestinal tract, um, the peritoneal, um, it is more prevalent in uh, the leptomeninges as well as um, orbits. So as far as treatment in metastatic ER positive breast cancer, um, in general, invasive lobular cancer, metastatic invasive lobular breast cancer is treated similar to invasive ductal cancers. Um, and the first line treatment, the standard first line treatment is in general endocrine treatment in combination with a CDK4-6 inhibitor. As far as second line treatments, there are a number of other targeted treatments in combination with endocrine therapy. And then further down, um, further lines of treatment include uh, chemotherapies. And more recently, uh, there are novel therapies called antibody drug conjugates um, that are part of treatment in metastatic ear positive breast cancer. So um, there are no specific studies looking at, at um, CDK4-6 inhibitors in lobular breast cancer, but um, there are several um, retrospective analyses, such as this large meta-analysis that shows that overall the benefit from um, CDK4-6 inhibitors in invasive lobular cancers is similar to invasive ductal cancers. It's important to note that in basal lobular metastatic invasive lobular cancers, there are multiple genetic alterations that can be potentially targetable. So it is important to look at the uh, genetic profile of invasive lobular cancers and metastatic disease, since um, we may um, one could find a potential um, genetic target with a um, potential um, drug. Um, in addition, an important um, genetic alteration that's more commonly seen in invasive lobular cancers are genetic alterations in the ERB2 gene, which is the HER2 protein. 
And a recent study um, called the Mute Her study uh, looked at um, the activity of a um, pan anti HER2 directed treatment called neratinib in metastatic ER positive breast cancers that have HER2 um, mutations, but not HER2 amplifications. Um, this study looked at the combination of neratinib plus um, endocrine treatment. And this was a small study, but what they did see was there was a clinical benefit rate of 38% in this patient population. And particularly um, the, uh, the clinical benefit rate um, was positively associated with invasive lobular cancer, suggesting that patients with metastatic invasive lobular cancers and a HER2 um, mutation might be more sensitive to neratinib. Um, and this really, um, this really supports further development of this drug uh, for invasive lobular cancers. Um, another um, study that was recently uh, published is a study based on, pre on observations that potentially invasive lobular cancers may be more sensitive to immunotherapies. Um, and this is the gelato um, study that was a study in metastatic disease for patients with invasive lobular cancer, looking at the combination of chemotherapy um, and an immune checkpoint inhibitor. Unfortunately, the um, clinical benefit from this study was marginal um, and did not really um, support continued, continued investigation of this study in this design. However, it's important to note um, first that there was one patient with ER positive invasive lobular cancer that did have a significant benefit from this um, treatment regimen, and also that this study did not select, select for specific patients that are possibly more likely to benefit from immune checkpoint inhibitors, and therefore future tri trials should um, look more into a selected patient population that is more likely to benefit from immune therapies. So in summary, and lastly, um, there is another uh, study in metastatic disease. This is the ROLO study that is also uh, looking at another, um, a different um, ROS1 inhibitor. Again, this is a study specific for patients with, um, this is a study looking in all cancers that have e um loss, but because invasive lobular cancer is a large um, uh, is a, is a cancer that in large has loss of e-cadherin. Um, there is an arm dedicated to invasive lobular cancers that will look at the combination of the ROS inhibitor prizotinib together with endocrine treatment. So in summary, um, it is clear that invasive lobular cancers is a distinct um, breast cancer. Um, there has been significant progress in understanding the unique biology of invasive cancer. And um, we now have um, ongoing trials dedicated to ILC, which is a significant advancement in the field. Um, some of the limitations that are that still exist is really the consensus in uh, diagnosis of invasive lobular cancer, and also the multiple vi variants of invasive lobular cancer that are usually um, not not looked at specifically in um, studies of large cohorts of lobular breast cancer or in specific clinical trials. Um, and one important uh, message is that we really need to um, we need collaborative efforts between efforts between multiple centers for further investigation of invasive lobular breast cancer. So with this, I'll end and thank you for your attention. Well, thank you all. That was, that was so much wonderful information crammed into a short amount of time. I wish we had another hour for questions, but I'm gonna try to, to send some of the, um, the ones we got more than once um, to each of you. Um, and I'm going to start with going back to um, Dr. Mir um, with a question about um, what screening methodology is recommended post-treatment for patients with lobular breast cancer, particularly after the hormone treatment may be done. So it's a great question. Thank you. Uh, we don't have, to my knowledge, specific guidelines for invasive lobular cancer surveillance. So we do we refer to our general guidelines of surveillance. And there is no 
one answer fits all because every patient is very unique. And it's a conversation that is had with the clinical team and the patient based on their personal risk profile. So some patients, um, even before their diagnosis, may have had an extremely high uh, lifetime risk of breast cancer. And those patients were going to offer something very different than those who had average risk. In general, though, the utility of, for example, MRI has been shown to be um, beneficial in patients who are have extremely dense breasts. Perhaps their initial uh, diagnosis of invasive globular carcinoma was what we would call mammographically occult, meaning completely invisible on mammogram. Patients who were diagnosed at a very young age. Um, in general, our baseline is that we do yearly mammogram and we would choose between, for all patients, we would do a yearly mammogram and we'll choose between our 3D mammogram or our contrast mammogram, again, based on a person's personal risk profile. So to follow up, because this was a second question, um, do you think that contrast enhanced mammogram will be the become the protocol for screening in the future if someone's had lobular breast cancer or just has very dense breasts? I think, so I will start by saying that contrast enhanced mammography is not readily available across the country. Um, however, in places where it is available, I think it's an incredibly useful, wonderful tool, uh, particularly in patients, again, who have dense breasts, who may have been diagnosed at a young age, um, and also based on perhaps their original disease burden. I do think it's an incredible tool, and it's something that we perform not infrequently at our institution for patients with such a history. Um, thank you for that. Um, next question for Dr. Mamtani. Um, are there uh, lobular breast cancer patients who are more likely to have lymph node involvement, even if that wasn't seen within the sentinel lymph node? That's a great question. Uh, and sort of fitting with the scope of questions we get with lobular breast cancer, you know, I think the general theme here is that it's hard to detect and that the burden may be difficult to ascertain until surgery is complete and you now have the ability to pathologically analyze it. So with the body of literature that we have right now, again, I alluded to this, the data is a little bit mixed. These are all small retrospective studies. So what we've done is we've taken small populations of lobular patients and looked at what was found at the time of surgery, looked at, you know, what was the frequency of sentinel node involvement, what was the frequency of non-sentinel lymph node involvement, and a small um, body of research does suggest, again, that there is a, a sort of slight uh, predisposition, perhaps, with the lobular biology to have nodal spread and perhaps non-sentinel involvement, but very limited, and again, there are, are also studies that don't show that. So at this point, when we talk to patients, um, you know, based on their clinical exam based on their imaging uh, interpretation. Uh, we determine whether they appear clinically node negative or positive. And at this moment in time, we would not tell a lobular breast cancer patient to necessarily worry that they are more likely to have nodal disease just based on the, the lobular histology alone. There are a lot of components that contribute to nodal involvement as well, like tumor stage, size, um, the grade of the tumor. There are other aspects that also will significantly uh, impact the likelihood of nodal spread. So uh, we have to take all of that into account and uh, can't really um, sort of make the lobular histology be the sole factor that we consider in that uh, decision. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and uh, second question, is there any surgery available for peritoneal spread of lobular breast cancer? That's a great question as well. Um, it's a, a tough situation when patients present with stage four disease uh, and the scenario you allude to, peritoneal spread, um, is a, sort of a classic example of what we see with lobular specifically. Lobular breast cancer uh, is sort of more inclined towards uh, spread to gastric tract and other such locations, whereas ductal types will more often metastasize to locations like bone and lung and so forth. So, um, um, uh, that is a classic story that we will sometimes hear about, but there is not surgery specifically for that at this time that is known to be highly effective. I know there is some work uh, being done in that realm, but at this point, there is not something that we routinely would do surgically for a patient with peritoneal disease, uh, unfortunately. Great. Thank you. Um, next question for you, Dr. Jesselson. Um, 
So we got many of these questions about the efficacy of liquid biopsies in predicting recurrence, um, how useful is breast cancer index, and related to that, what after you finished your first five years of hormone treatment, what should you be doing next? And is there a new protocol? So that's two questions. Yeah, yeah. so one regarding um, ctDNA um, and use of ctDNA as surveillance. So as of today, that is all in um, research. Uh, we don't use that in routine or standard practice um, since we don't really have any data that doing that changes outcomes and it also doesn't change how we treat patients at this time. But hopefully um, in the near future, we will have more um, results from the ongoing studies and it may, may become practice, uh, practice in the future. As far as treatment, so uh, for many patients, we do give extended endocrine treatment beyond five years and up to 10 years of treatment. And really right now, we most of us use um, clinical factors to determine the risk of late recurrences, which for most patients, uh, the risk of late recurrence is similar to the risk, the risk factors of late recurrence is similar to the risk factors of early recurrences. Um, there is um, the BCI, um, which is another, which is a, a tool to determine um, late recurrences, and some clinicians do use that, but it hasn't been shown to be necessarily better than the usual clinical factors that we use. Great, thank you. Um, and a couple of questions about the trials um, in the slide with the um, already FDA approved drugs. Um, are there any lobular specific studies on those drugs and efficacy in lobular breast cancer? And might that be a good target for research? Yeah. So one study that I showed was the neratinib um, drug, which is um, neratinib is an approved drug and um, HER2 um, mutations, not amplifications, are more common in, in lobular breast cancer. So um, for a patient who is diagnosed with a HER2 alteration, neratinib is, is an option. Um, and um, definitely, you know, additional studies. This was the study that I showed. Mute HER is a very small study of just a uh, a few tens of patients, and um, hopefully there will be larger studies to look at that, and that will include um, a dedicated arm to patients with invasive lobular cancer. I think I can only ask one more, and there's so many. <laughs> um, um, well, one more question for you. Um, who, who can enroll in the ROS1 trial? And what are the... Which, which one? So there are two of them. Oh. Uh, one is for neoadjuvant uh, treatment, and that is basically anybody who has early stage um, ER pos uh, invasive lobular breast cancer that's ER positive, um, who hasn't had any surgery or any treatment beforehand. Um, but to keep in mind, this is a very small study. So the number of slots available is limited and it is uh, being conducted in Europe. Um, the, other, the other study, um, which is for metastatic disease, um, is basically for also um, any patient who has invasive lobular cancer um, who has a um, loss of a coherent. Great, thank you. Okay, this, this is the last question <laughs> for Dr. Mamtani. Um, do you think uh, an MRI before surgery will become protocol for patients diagnosed with lobular breast cancer? This has got to be one of the most controversial things that comes up in uh, the radiology and surgery discussions about lobulars. So uh, I, I don't think I would go so far as to say it would be protocol just based on the lobular histology. But like Dr. Amir very eloquently said, um, MRI can be useful. And I, I would say that uh, we can selectively utilize that. And, and frankly, with contrast enhanced mammography in the mix as well, I think we have to be judicious with which imaging modalities we use. And 
really one size fits all has, has never really been an approach in breast cancer that we take, right? So I think that it would not really be a protocol, but it's a good tool to keep in our back pocket. And I personally use it, you know, when there are situations that I think it will give me information um, in clarifying extent of disease uh, for any patient, not just lobular breast cancer patients. So uh, I wouldn't call it protocol, but I think it's a very handy tool to keep in our pocket and use um, to help us whenever we need it. Great, thank you. Well, I have two more pages of questions, so we'll be sending them to you afterwards. Um, thank you so much to all of our speakers. Uh, it's really been a wonderful panel and, and thank you for sharing your slides and, and um, we will be sharing this recording with everyone. Um, and thank you all of you who attended and for the questions that you sent in to us. Um, and thank you for joining. Thank you for having us.